on a series. This is number 10, session number 10 of this series of fruitfulness by sanctification. You can see it in the banner. And uh, we want to thank God for uh, the first nine topics. Last week, Pastor Moses led us on divine creativity, which was out of the ones that we are starting to look at in the terms of uh, sanctification of the soul. Thank you very much. And we thank God indeed because he helped us to, through that session, be opened up into, led very well into the sanctification of the body, which will be the last four topics we'll be looking at over the next few weeks. Today we'll be looking at fruitfulness by grace, and I want to encourage every one of us to please connect. The message of grace is one that is either misunderstood or misapplied in the body of Christ in many cases. There are more people who are misunderstanding grace or misapplying grace than those who understand the balance of grace. And I want to believe God, we do deal with grace a lot in this church, probably twice a year we talk extensively about grace and virtually in every message it comes out in one way or the other. But I want us to understand that this is the big gift of God to mankind. And in terms of the sanctification plan of God for us is to be sanctified, spirit, soul, and body. This is why we'll be reading 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 to 24. And verse 24 says, he who is faithful, who calls you is faithful, he will also do it. Verse 24, he calls you and he will also do it. He calls you and he will also do it. That is his plan and that is his intention. So when we talk about grace, grace is basically free and unmerited favor of God. We see it manifested in our salvation and the bestowal of blessings upon us. Now, it is a trivial thing to just look at it in terms of being an unmerited favor. Why should God give us unmerited favor? Why should God extend to us unmerited favor? We will need to understand the place of grace today so that we can optimize. You see, when you take on a new job, if you are to manage a team or you are to have some responsibility, one of the first things they will tell you are the, the, the characteristics of the team and the things you need to do in the light of the objective. But very importantly, you will be shown the tools that you have, the software, the different platforms, the systems to store the data and so many things that you need to do, depending on the level of that uh, 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 appointment or that assignment. Grace is given by God for a specific purpose. And this is why I want us to understand that when we don't understand this purpose, of course, as we all know from the great servant of God, Miles Monroe, abuse becomes inevitable. Abuse of grace is prevalent in our circumstances and situations in life today as a people simply because we don't understand. God blesses us so that we can be people who can be a blessing, a people who can undertake his Agenda. He extends grace to us so that we can be partakers of his divine agenda for this end time. John chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible says, And the word became flesh, and it dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory. And it was full of grace and truth. So Jesus, say with me, Jesus, Jesus. is grace personified. Jesus is grace personified. The word of God is the word of his grace. And when he came in the flesh, the Bible says he was full. The Bible says in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily, but he was full of grace and truth. And in verse 17, he said that the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were given through Jesus Christ. So when a person receives Jesus, they must understand that they become carriers of grace and truth. When a person gives their lives to Christ, one of the evident fruits that they must bear is that they are carriers of grace and truth. Grace is expressed through the Holy Spirit manifesting in us. You know the seven manifestations of the Holy Spirit we read a lot in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 2. Let's go again through them. The Bible says the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Let's read together. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and might. The spirit of the knowledge 
and of the fear of the Lord. Now, the spirit of counsel and might are very, very much tied to the manifestation of grace. The counsel of God advising us to and beseeching us to seek the grace of God that has been extended to humanity. And the spirit of might is the enabling form of the grace that we have received. God is able to do. God is able to give us all grace so that we can abound to works. So the spirit of counsel draws us near to grace, to continue to tap into grace, to continue to seek grace, to continue to seek after grace, and the spirit of might helps us to do those things that grace is released to us to do. So the first thing God is looking for in humanity by his grace is for salvation. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. Everyone God is seeking to bring to salvation so that men can serve him obediently. We have looked extensively at the story of the children of Israel being released from Egypt and the whole purpose. God said to Moses, he said, go and tell Pharaoh that he should let his people go that they may do what? Serve him. It's not that he should let them go that they should go and live anyhow in a new land. No, it is for a purpose. So bondage is what the devil tries to use to hold people down. And you know, he took God's mighty right hand to deliver those people. And this is why we must understand why we need grace consistently. The same devil is continuing to seek for ways to hold people down so that they cannot serve God very well. He has not changed tactics. He is repeating the same principle, the same strategy of trying to keep people in Egypt. Grace is what God is released to mankind today to say, be, embrace my grace and be led into salvation. The Bible says, for the grace of God that brings salvation, verse 11 again, has appeared to all men. It has appeared to all men. It has appeared to you and I. Now, we have responded to it by faith. That is why we are saved today. Hallelujah. There are still many men and women around us who are yet to respond to it by faith the way we have done. And we have a duty to use the grace we have embraced, responded to by faith, to continue to plead to those who are around us, that God is pleading, that they too respond by faith. This is why the devil will do anything to make your voice and my voice one that will be difficult to do that because he knows that the more there are people who are responding to that grace by faith, the less he has his, the, the, the population of hell, the, the more the population of hell is depopulated. So he walks tirelessly day and night to keep people in a place that is Egypty, Egyptian, Egypt nature, Egypt-like, so that they can find it difficult to serve God and join this agenda of God to recruit man from the claws of the wicked one. Verse 12 says, the grace of God is teaching us, somebody say counsel, Say it's counseling us. Consistently telling us those things that can put us in bondage again. Those things that we must continue not to do so that the one who kept us in bondage from whom we have been delivered will not find an occasion to hold us again. It teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly loss, we should live. Somebody say the spirit of might. We should have the strength to live soberly, go back to verse 12, please. To live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. God knows that the present age will bring perilous times, perilous challenges, temptations of many things, busyness, the things that will choke, that will seek to choke God's people and make life difficult. He knows. But he said what we should understand is that the grace of God continues to teach us. Go back to verse 11. It teaches us first. The Bible says it appears us first and brings us salvation. Many of us receive it and then we let go. We don't understand that we continue. Verse 12 now. We continue to need to go back to, to him to learn 
through the spirit of counsel, that we study his word, fellowship together, sharpening one another, praying for one another, so that we can be learning that we need to continue to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. The greatest strategy of the devil is to keep people in ignorance. So people are trying to, to work out salvation, which they have received by grace, in their own strength. And God said, no, you have to continue to rely on grace to be teaching you that you need to continue to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. Let that counsel continue to walk in your heart by the spirit of counsel consistently every day of your life. Then allow the spirit of might, even when that counsel is at work in you, allow the spirit of might to give you the energy to be denying, to be living soberly and denying all kinds of ungodliness and living righteously in this age. And then verse 13, he said, we must continue to look for what? The blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. I believe that the reason why people backslide is a loss of focus of what the Bible says in verse 13. When you forget where you are going, you can stop anywhere. You don't stop in life, in anything, or turn back until you get to your destination. But the day you, the moment you either don't know your destination or you've lost sight of it, that is what makes you stop and just relax where you are or even turn back to where you are going. How many of you have driven out, especially those earlier days of sat navs, and you reach the place, one town like that, that nobody has heard of, and you reach the place and you look at your sat nav, your sat nav is looking at you. <laughs> There's no road, there's map there, there's not. We used to have that a lot in the early 2000s, 2004, 5. So those of us who were very clever, we didn't throw away our maps. So people bought cars those days and had sat nerves. And when they got to certain places, they begged to come back. They looked for signal to call people to help them back because sat nerves were not yet covering those areas. So we were very clever. We took our A to Z. Those of you that probably didn't know, there was a time in this country to go anywhere, you had to use A to Z. How many of you use A to Z? You see, very few. <laughs> you are getting old, all of you. <laughs> Just joking. But you know, A to Z was what we used. So our brains were working well. You brought out your map, you look at where you are going, you look at the A to Z, is, all the streets are alphabetical order, isn't it? Alphabetical order. So you know, if they say it's Gray Street, you'll go to G, you look for it. Then you start looking all over the map. When you find it, you look at the coordinate. Yeah? Coordinate one. Thank you, sir. <laughs> coordinate one <laughs> and coordinate two. Then you will now plot your journey yourself. You plot it yourself. You put it at your side. You get your son or your wife or your spouse to hold the map. Hallelujah. In this country. So when certain apps came, it was like, it, it, I can't believe this. <laughs> But you know, when the Satanas first came, it was very difficult. They were not all covering everywhere. So many times you were frustrated and you got back to where you are coming from without achieving what you went for. It's not, not, not like now. Now we have cars that virtually you speak to them, they give you the map. And in some cases now, not yet as popular, but in some cases now, they can actually drive you to the place. Have you seen them demonstrated? Driverless cars. I'm waiting to buy one. I'm really waiting. <laughs> God have mercy. I'm just waiting the day I will sit down. That thing is taking me to Brighton. <laughs> I'll just sit down like that and say, this is life. <laughs> so I'm praying hard that God will make it possible for us. <laughs> Hallelujah. But it's, it's already happening. It's already happening. What I'm trying to say is that we have a sense of purpose of where we are going and there is the energy to keep going because we know where we are going and we know the rewards of getting there. When people don't look for that blessed hope, verse 13, and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, they stop depending on grace. They stop depending on grace and then they give up. You will not give up your race Amen. in the mighty name of Jesus. If you look at Noah, we read this story in Genesis chapter 6. Bro, Yemi led us very powerfully earlier on today from verse 1 to 22. But there are some things I want to quickly bring out of there. The Bible says in verse 7, So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created. This is Genesis 6, 7 now. 
whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I made them. And then verse 9. Let's read verse, verse 8 together. Verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah pleases God. Now, this may look like God singled out Noah, which is true in a way. But the reality is that Noah responded differently. Noah responded differently to the grace of God. The same grace that Titus was talking about, appearing to all men for salvation, was available for everyone at that time. But if you read from Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says people were doing what they liked. Still present in today's age, where certain people feel that, you know, gone are the days where there is a need to serve God. Gone are the days where you need to be religious, in quote. But Noah found grace because he was a man who saw that there was still a room for being delivered from this evil world and his heart was right before God. The Bible says in verse 9, this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah did what? Walked with God. Not God, walk with Noah. Noah made up his mind to walk with God. You want to draw grace, you make up your mind to walk with God. You make up your mind to keep going for grace. You make up your mind to keep tapping into grace. Because as long as you are walking with God, as long as you are determined to be focused on him and on him alone, then you will find. The Bible makes us to understand that in this New Testament covenant, that the focus must be on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Every one of us must come to the place where we are determined to continue to walk with God. This is what the work of faith is all about. The work of faith got us salvation. We got new birth. Fantastic. But the work of faith also means that we continue after new birth to keep going by faith, drawing grace. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourself, but it is the gift of God. This salvation we have is a gift of God, but we need to let our faith connect to the grace which God has made available. It's not of works, verse 9 says, least anyone should boast. Let's read verse 10 together. Verse 10 is very important. Why do we have all this grace? Why do we have the salvation? Let's go together. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is why I said that there is an erroneous message of grace that says, for example, one of them that says that grace should not be mixed with works. Simply because such people tend to portray that anyone who preaches works is saying that you have to work for grace. No, the Bible says it's not of works. It's not of works, but it is for works. There are two different things. Grace is not obtained of works, but it is obtained for works. Did you read that in your Bible? Verse 10 again. Let's look at verse 10 and let's read it again so you understand what I'm saying. Everybody, let's go. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. How were we coming to Christ? For by grace you have been saved through faith. That's what Ephesians 2, 8 says. So you become a new creation in Christ by faith. As the grace has come, you come through, through, by grace through faith, you become created in Christ. But you are created for what? Good works, which God had done what? Prepared beforehand that we should what? Walk in them. So in essence, we do not work for grace, but we receive grace for good works. So when we are saved, we must be consistently reverting to him to locate the specific grace that we need always. I've told you that the spirit of might is not just something that enables you to be strong physically. The spirit of might is what gives you an emotional stability. If you are not strong emotionally, you cannot be a balanced Christian. You can't be. You can't. You will be tossed here and there. The day things are good, you'll be happy. The day things are thrown at you, you will be sad. And that's not how God wants you to live. The spirit of might is what gives you that stability that does not allow you to see the wind boisterous or the people shouting Hosanna. There are many believers who will be believers as long as people are shouting Hosanna around them. Hosanna, Hosanna, well done. God bless you. Oh, well done. You are beautiful. You are good. 
Then the energy is there. They are going. But the moment they say you are stupid, you are crazy, you are this, they, they go down. <laughs> Hallelujah. You cannot afford to be a believer who is responsible. Now, it is good to compliment one another. It is good to, to, to be there in such a way that we are encouraging one another. That's what the Bible says. But we must understand that we need the spirit of might in our inside. Helping us to use the grace of God that got us saved to keep us going. If you are going to attain anything for good and for God in this end time, you must be strong. Emotionally, you must be strong. Say with me, I will be strong spiritually. I will be strong emotionally. And I will be strong physically. You need to be strong physically. If you leave this body, it just wants to sleep. Do you notice that? It just wants to eat and sleep. The body doesn't like work at all. When you sit down to work, it will crack, crack, crack. <laughs> you have to tell it. It's time to work. Hallelujah. It likes to sleep. It likes to eat. It likes to do all the things that are just enjoyment. If you leave the body. It is the strength of God on your inside that disciplines the body. What Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, that he buffets his body. He disciplines his body. And it subjects it to obedience so that when it is time to pray, it prays. When it is time to study the word, it study. When it is time to do something of a vocational work, it does it. When it's something to do something of a physical, to go from one place to the other, it does it. There are some visitations I do that if I had my way at that point in time, I would really want to be sleeping. Because I probably have been working for hours. And then just that one hour window that I have to kind of recuperate. But then... A call comes through, or oh, but then my wife reminds me and say, have we seen this person? Have we checked this thing? And then I said, we haven't. <laughs> when is the time we can do it? She said, I'm free now. <laughs> and it's like, clearly, that is an opportunity. But if I had a choice, I would say, I want to sleep now. And I'm not saying you should not sleep when you should sleep. I'm only saying that you have to, at times, subject your body to those kind of sacrifices if you want to run this race. But for you to be able to do that, you need grace. You need the grace of God working in you through the spirit of might. Hebrews 4.16 tells us that we should come therefore boldly to the throne of grace. Hebrews 4.16, that we may obtain mercy and do what? Find grace to help in the time of need. God knows that there will be a time of need. God knows that every day there will be something that you need. You need the energy for the day. You need some kind of thing to do. You need some wisdom to make some discussions. You need some kind of uh, counsel to do something. Whatever. There is always a need. You need money to do certain things. You need some other resource. You just always have need, 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 need. Now, the Bible says God will supply all those needs according to his riches and glory, which is just to reassure you that there is nothing you need that cannot be obtained. But you need to keep going boldly to find the grace to help you for that time of need. And I pray that as God opens up this word to you today, you will always locate the grace you need. In the mighty name of Jesus. You will always locate the grace you need because God wants you to be able to do everything that he has commanded you. When we read in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 22, the Bible says, And Noah did according to all that God commanded him. You need grace. He did according to all that God commanded him. Powerful testimony. When you are sent of God, not necessarily until you become a preacher, as every Christian is sent of God, we are all called into the ministry of reconciliation, it is very paramount that we know how to apply grace to help us in the time of need to be able to do all that God has called us to do. Now, we must never doubt the ability of God to supply such grace. 2 Corinthians 9, I'm just giving these scriptures to help us look at four areas that I would like us to examine in terms of this grace. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7, uh, verse 8. It says, and God is able to do what? Verse 8 now. And God is able to do what? To make all grace abound toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. This verse is what kingdom prosperity is all about. I'd like to just take another couple of minutes to explain it. The word, Christ, the, the, the word prosperity has become so abused in the body of Christ and twisted, as you would expect. The devil has taken advantage of ignorance and greed of people 
to make it mean whatever people want it to mean. None of those things are true. The truth is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. We're going to read it together again, and I want you to think through every phase. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8. Let's go. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Stop there. Say, God is able. able. So I have no reason reason. to doubt him him whatsoever. The biggest pleasure you give to God is to believe him. You want God to be your friend? Just believe him. And the Bible says he told Abraham, he said, come out of your people. And the Bible says, and Abraham moved. And then he became his friend. It's very simple. Just believe him. And how do you believe God? Keep reminding yourself, God is able. God is able. God is not a man that he should lie. Don't ever put God in the category of any man. Man may tell you, I don't have money. And then you now think that God is saying he doesn't have money. You have missed the point. By the way, when God calls you and God commissions you to do anything whatsoever, don't think about what you need to do it as a hindrance. Think about the one who sends you. How many of you will, will, will send a text message to your child? Maybe it's a teenager and it's, in a, it's, it's somewhere and you want them to buy something that they don't have the money to buy. You know they don't have the money to buy. Will you tell them to buy it and bring it? Or what will you do first? Send them money first. You will first say, I have sent money to your account and please go into that shop and buy this thing for me. And then the child, the young person will go there and do that. This is how we must see the ability of God. When he said he has called us into the ministry of reconciliation, the Bible says he is able to make all grace abound toward us. And then he said that you, go and put it back up, that you always having all sufficiency in all things. Say with me, raise your right hand, say, by the grace of God, I can have all sufficiency in all things. It depends on how you want to believe. It depends on how you want to believe. The degree to which you believe that sufficiency is what delivers to you. The degree to which you believe that God can make you all sufficient is what delivers to you. Whether it's in your health, whether it's in your money, whether it is in favor, whatever it is, it is the degree to which we have faith to believe. Because the Bible says always having all sufficiency in all things. Three things there, all, all, all. Always having all sufficiency in all things at all times. So there should never be a time when the wisdom is lacking and then you find yourself doing some foolish thing, having some foolish conversation, some strife, something. Take a step back and say, where have I stopped the sufficient God here? And draw grace, draw grace to receive the wisdom to know how to address that matter. It helps you in everything. The Bible says God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you may have all sufficiency in all things and you may be able to have an abundance for every good work. God wants you to do good work, but before he talked about the good work, you can see all grace, his ability to provide all grace. This is why you must understand that when you have an important exam or something important to do, don't just go bare-chested. David was confronted confronted by Goliath, or he went to confront Goliath, and he he didn't just, even though it looked like a physical war, the words of David showed that he was relying on God 100%. He said, you are defiling the armies of the Lord. He said, that God will help me. And it was clear, there is a need for you in every way to keep depending on the grace of God. This is why many times we fail to achieve the things that we ought to achieve. I believe very strongly that this is not just a message to run ministry, but it is very important for ministry. Any aspect of ministry that you want to run, whether it is just for you as a person serving as a witness for God or is all the way to a church level ministry, you must understand that you need the grace of God. One of the biggest disservice you can do to yourself is to think that you can ever do anything by power or by might, especially when you have experience doing it. Never ever let the devil convince you subtly that you don't need God. You will not say it, but your actions by not praying, by not really going for that grace, by not really demonstrating that you are physically 
emotionally, spiritually connecting to the grace of God is tantamount to nothing other than to say you have got it sorted. This is why many marriages struggle. This is why many people struggle in their finances. They hit one thing today and then they think they've got it all sorted. You must understand that you need grace all the time. Every time. There are people in my line of business that I do in consulting that have not gone two years and certain things, have, it can be so messy when things go wrong. God forbid, it's terrible. Court case, problem here, problem there, and so many things. By the grace of God, I've been going 15 years, but I always realize with every new project that comes, I say, Lord, I need your wisdom here. I need your help here. I need your favors here. Every one of us must understand this. We have been going by the grace of God as a church almost nine years. Let's give the Lord a big hand, a big, big hand. If it was left to the devil, this church would not have got off the ground at all. Not to talk of surviving one year. <laughs> if it was left to the devil. I asked, I said, I asked, my, my wife and I were praying. And I, so many things in 2013, attack here and there. Friends turned away from me. People called me names. All kinds of things were going on in my life. I asked my wife. I said, but why would friends do this? This is a good thing. God is starting something new. Can't people just see? It's beautiful. Another church that will serve God, serve humanity, do things because the vision was so clear that we will touch nations and we will do so many special things that God is calling us to do that we are starting to see some of them today by his grace. My wife said to me, he said, Tammy, which she calls me, he said, the devil is not afraid of you today. He's not concerned about you today. He's afraid of what you can become. I said, thank you so much, you are God sent. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. That changed everything for me. The devil will always be afraid of what you can become and what you can do. But you must never ever let go of the grace of God who has commenced you in that journey of salvation and will see you to the end. I say he will see you to the end. Amen. In the mighty name of Jesus. So God's ability to supply all grace for every good work must never be doubted. Very quickly, I want to take you through four things that we must always draw grace to serve God for. Number one is grace for witnessing and kingdom service. I've touched on some of these, but I want to emphasize them. Grace for witnessing and kingdom service. Many of us must understand that to serve God, we need grace. A believer who is trying to serve God in his own strength, in his own way, will soon fizzle out. There is no two ways. There is no new improved version of Christianity that says you don't need to pray anymore. No, yes, maybe these days you can have an audio Bible that is reading the Bible to you, but at least you are still hearing the word of God. You are still obeying faith. It comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There is no new improved version, that's a, by a version of Christianity that says we should stop preaching to other people. Despite the attempts of the enemy to stifle out evangelism today, what God is only saying is that we can modernize, we can change our approach. About 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 is too far, even 25 years ago, we didn't have facilities to live stream like this. If you were going to live stream anything from your church, you paid thousands of pounds, tens of thousands of pounds every month to make it happen on cable and satellite television. Now you can virtually do it with a phone. You can do it with the simplest of devices that cost you peanuts compared to what it used to cost. So we transform and transmogrify our processes and our systems and our style. But believers do not understand that it takes a grace to move from how things were done to how things need to be done now. And to understand the wisdom of God in engaging. Acts 1.8 says, but you shall receive power. The power of the Holy Spirit is not just a power to be healing, uh, healing sick people and casting out demons. This power is also talking about brain power. It's also talking about creativity. It's also talking about strategy. It's also talking about style. We are not just involved in projects like Commonwealth Fellowships, which we'll still talk about by the grace of God. We are not just involved in those kind of projects for the sake of nothing to do. It is a strategy. Somebody say strategy. Can't you see? It's a strategy. It's a strategy. Gone at, when I was a young boy, when my father used to lead the educational department of the church, in the church I grew up, they raised money in the church for everything. 
everything. They wanted to build a nursery school. He was the chairman of the committee. They raised the money for about four years. I remember they were contributing and contributing. Then they built the floor, first floor, and then they built the second floor, and then they, they started that nursery primary school. In the 70s, in the late 70s, early 80s. I remember because I was very close to him. How many of you remember that story? I told you that the first time I came on stage in my life, I was four years old. Anybody heard that story from me before? Very good. It was because of that school. They bought new furniture, young children furniture that people had not seen before. So they wanted to demonstrate it. And uh, the man, the other elder who was working with my dad was looking for the pastor's son, who was my friend, to come and launch it. But my friend was very shy, so he ran out of the church. I didn't know they had planned all that. So the man looked around for another young child that could do it. Then he found me. He said, David, come. I walked up to him. 600 people sat down. I walked up to him. And then he whispered to me. He said, what you will do is this. When I'm speaking about the chairs, you will come from your seat and sit down as if you have just come into school and you will pretend as if you are writing. He said, can you do that? I was four years old. He said, can you do that? I said, I'll try. <laughs> So when he started speaking, I walked up stage and everybody was looking, what would this kid do? And I sat down there. there. There was a paper there and some pen, just not writing anything, but I was so serious about it. And I was doing that. And it was like we had rehearsed it together. So he was so impressed. The church was so impressed. Everybody was clapping and they were so thrilled. But that picture gave them a sense. They wanted to buy those chairs, so they bought the, the, the sample so that people can see and contribute money towards it. So when I looked up and people were so excited and clapping, I said, is this the power of the stage? Just from being here, people are so excited about it. That was the first day I understood that there is power in standing in front of many people. I never saw it. So that man didn't know that he launched me to stage ministry that day. Since that day, my energy comes when you put me on stage. <laughs> <laughs> Even when I teach in secular gatherings, I'm very serious with one or two or ten, but the more the people, the more my energy, the more my energy goes. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is this. It is a grace. We need that power to give us the strategy, strategy for the Holy Spirit to help us to be witnesses. You heard last, was it last week, we were hearing from Pastor Moses here how Divine creativity can come with the speaking of the tongues that makes it possible for everybody around us to hear. Everybody was hearing the witness because the power of the Holy Spirit. It is a grace that God works in us. Let us not limit that power to speaking in tongues only. Let us understand. When we started that program, for example, like I said, and uh, we, I said in my father's days, they used to raise money. Now, that program, if we were to raise money to do it, we would have needed to raise not less than 60 to 80,000, my estimate, 70 to 80,000 pounds to do it. The program we have just finished, by the, or we're about to finish, we have not yet finished, we're about to finish. We would have had to raise it. I would have said, here, yeah, I need 80 families here to give me one 1,000 each, and then you'll be pledging, and <laughs> hallelujah. But it just cost us brain power to put a good proposal together and to get brethren to volunteer to be parts of it in different ways. The wisdom of God. But you see, those six fellows, we're going to pray for them today. You know that I've said to you before. But those six fellows, man and women, I was going to say men and women, I remember it's one man. Man and women of God are not, have not just come here to learn about things. They have also come and they are leaving this country as missionaries. I can tell you that. Let's put our hands together. The wisdom of God. The wisdom of God. There are things that we need to understand. In Acts chapter 8 verse 1, the Bible says Saul was consenting to the death of Stephen. At that time, great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. Go straight to verse 4. Then there were those who were scattered, went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip, somebody say Philip. One of them went down, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. What happened when grace came upon this man? Let's read verse 6 together. Verse 6. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Somebody say grace. There was a divine manifestation of the power on Philip that was not just about the speaking in tongues which they encountered in Acts chapter 2, but there was the multitudes that agreed together in one accord, hidden the things spoken by Philip. 
Every one of us must understand this, that the grace for witnessing is one that God will give us strategies and the power to do which, what God has called us to do. And the power of God was also manifesting. Verse 7 says, Unclean spirits were crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed, and lame were healed. Lame were healed. Now, you may ask me and say, how does it tie to the kind of example I gave with the fellows? Now, those fellows came here and they learned, they have learned and they are still learning a lot of things. Their minds have opened up to see how many processes can be applied when they go back home. Now, a lot of lives will be saved by the knowledge that they are going to communicate to other people. Do you understand what I'm saying? A lot of lives, people who did not have access to education, especially in deprived areas, because of the little, little things that God helped us to be able to do, to put in them, pray with them, stand with them. Hallelujah. I want you to understand the wider scope. Now, this does not mean we stop praying for people to be healed. We stop praying for the lame to be, to be delivered and all those kind of things. That, that has nothing to do with it. But what I'm saying is that the church for so long refuses to understand the move of God in opening up grace for this agenda of the end time. We all need to know that there is a grace that is given to us to be witnessing and to be, to be witnesses and kingdom servants. God wants us to be fulfilled. There is no way a person can be like Philip if he is not sound in himself, if he is not resourced in himself. This is why the Bible says if we continue to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all the things that we need will be added to us. Let us never forget the, the commission to be a witness means God is committed to your life matters. Hallelujah. God, I say God is committed to your life matters. In the name of Jesus. Never doubt God's commitment to you. Never. I know that one of the things that God has helped me in life is to understand that I have deep roots to the glory of his name that enables me to remember that he is committed to the cause which he has called me. Whatever that cause is. So every one of us must see the grace of God operating not just for us to be able to be serving and doing those things but also to be able to have the things we need to do. I don't know where I would have been if God has not given me the energy, the wisdom to his glory, the resources, physical resources. Do you know how much goes out of my hand every week to people in this place and other places? Every week. When I add it up at times, I don't know how much. I don't know how much I would, I don't know how I would have been able to raise such amounts if it has it's not been God who put it there. Since this ministry started, I can't tell you things. I, I just sit down and say, how do you find the energy? How do you find the thing? To do kingdom work needs you to just be obedient like Noah. When you connect to God, grace is released. I say, when you connect to God, grace is released. And this grace will supply everything that you need in the mighty name of Jesus. Do you know that we are writing, as we are starting now, we are writing two proposals this weekend. We, we, one, one is coordinated by one person, another one coordinated by another person. Within 24 hours, I looked at the two proposals and I saw what God is putting in us to do. And it set us five, we have not finished them, we are still on them, but it set us five steps ahead. And then I said to myself, if it is not God, you can't be this. I want you to be encouraged as we preach the word, as teach the word. If you have faith, I believe very strongly that if you have faith to connect this way, you will find that a lot of the things you are worrying about will stop being a concern to you. I don't worry about money. I have learned that God is the one who supplies money. I went home to bury my father late last year, those of you know, in September, and we were finishing the service. Then one of the pastors came, held my hand, and took me to one uncompleted building outside the church. <laughs> outside the church. He said, this is building, your father started it. <laughs> it was supposed to be the pastor's quarters. He said, you see the nursery school, he built it. My father was a pensioner. He never did business like me. He had no head for business at all. He was a pure academic. In me, I refused to be that kind of way. <laughs> but God blessed whatever was in his hand. God blessed it. So he built a lot of things around and things I didn't even know about. So they were telling me things. Then they said, they want to trust God that I will finish it. I said, keep trusting God. I said, all of us will finish it. <laughs> I say, all of us will finish it. <laughs> don't, 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 don't look at me and say you are trusting God. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
The building is almost finished now to the glory of God. Almost finished. Almost finished. He asked me how the money came. I don't know. But the one who owns it, every week, every week, every month, things come. I send it to them. Things come. They pray. They pray. They say, God bless you. I say, yeah, he's blessing me. <laughs> keep praying. Keep praying. <laughs> he's blessing me. What am I saying, friends? You worry too much about things. that are, If I want to look at the physical, because I have things. I have things. I have my own personal projects. I have things. I have family. I have things. I have this church. I have things to do as well. If I want to look in the physical in that September, I will say, no, forget it. I will say, yes, it will happen, but don't, don't bring it up now. <laughs> Hallelujah. God will keep supplying all grace towards you. Anything to do with this kingdom that you connect to, God will not leave you without a witness. In your life, you will feel the tangibility of his presence. In the mighty name of Jesus. Souls that are perishing on a daily basis need churches to be vibrant and solid and in a healthy condition. It needs pastors who will be strong. Blessed. He needs leaders who will, who will continue to do work without looking at anything else. It needs you and I to be people who will be strong. And God knows it. He knows it. So if he knows it, he will open doors for us. What we all need is just that faith to believe him, to be ready to walk on water. When we step out like that, God commits to our stepping out for kingdom service. So I want to charge you that don't think you can serve God in your strength anymore. Keep trusting him. I say keep trusting him. Yes. And God will be blessing the work of your hands. In the mighty name of Jesus. Number two, very important aspect of life. There is a need for grace for marital success. Genesis 2 verse 18. The Lord said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Verse 24 says, therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Verse 25. Verse 25. Now let's go. He said, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. One of the things God does through marriage and is insist, intending to do through marriage is to help remove nakedness and shame. To help make impossible nakedness and shame. One of the things the devil tries to do is to put those things into it. The Bible says marriage is honorable in Hebrews 13.4 with the marriage bed undefiled. So every one of us must understand and see the place that God intends for us. Whether you are married now or you are looking forward, you are looking unto God for a marital partner there, or for a marriage partner, God is committed to the institution of marriage. I say he's committed to the institution of marriage. The favor you need to find and the favor you need to be found will come to you by the grace of God. That is if you are not yet married in Jesus' name. Because if you are married, you have now been found or you have found. Amen. Don't say, Pastor, thank you very much. I'm still looking. <laughs> no, he said, come and let's talk about that one. <laughs> let's talk about that one because you shouldn't be looking again. The one you have found, let's talk about it and let's trust God. Hallelujah. But the truth is that there is a grace for it because God was the first to say, I created man and it is not good for him to be alone. Why do you think God will not be committed to the institution he started to make it good for man. He said two are better than one. There is a grace. Every time you find your marriage struggling and you find yourself struggling in the things of marriage, I want you to draw that grace. Whatever your stage, if it is the grace to be found, say, Lord, don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on yourself. In this, my life, I've seen all kinds of marriages. Marriage at age 20, marriage at age 40, it means nothing. I've seen children born after 25 years, you saw my friend's story, 25 years, that's the highest I've seen so far. After 25 years, I'm not saying you have to wait that long or you, have, you will have to wait that long, but I'm telling you, I have seen it. I've seen children born just barely nine months, nine months like this. We were, we were praying that hope it was not even before the marriage that the thing was, because it was just exactly nine months and the, the person was born. And I've seen those who waited for nine years, I've seen, I've seen 25 years. It means nothing to God to bring about anything that makes marriage sweet. And your marriage will surely be receiving that grace in the mighty name of Jesus. One of the things the, the, the uh, grace in marriage gives us is the wisdom to live with one another. You need the wisdom to understand your partner and the person you are with. Understand their strengths, understand their weaknesses. 
God intentionally puts strengths and weaknesses in people and brings them together so that they can complement each other. We fight over our strengths because we think you should be strong as I am strong in this area. And the other one thinks you should be strong as they are strong in that area. If only we see that your strength in managing money means you be the one managing our money, then there will be no fight in it. Instead of fighting with that your spouse that he or she is always wasting money, say, honey, let me take care of this thing. <laughs> because you seem to have a better sense of it. Let me take care of it. It can be the man or the woman. It doesn't matter. There is no rule that says only a man should man. When they will say, I, 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 I have to be the one man. No, no, no. There's no rule that says that. If the woman can manage the money better, let her manage it. Let her manage it. At the end, you will see a woman who will buy things, buy things, buy things, and yet you will still see that there is 500 pounds in the account. In your own, you go, you bring one thing like that, you put it on the table, and all the money has finished. <laughs> all the money has finished. And the whole house is looking, what is this thing that this man bought for us? <laughs> You don't know whether it's a gadget. You don't know whether it's a toy. <laughs> and the man said, that's what I use our money to buy. <laughs> but the woman will buy this, change this, do new furniture. Do you know, do new things, new bed sheets. And, th and then she'll show you the account that there's still 250 pounds left. After all that, that means from that point, she should start managing your money. <laughs> Hallelujah. Dance to your strengths. God put graces in us. Somebody can talk better, let them do the talking. Somebody can plan better, let them do the planning. Somebody can drive better. Again, there's no rule that says when you are traveling, it has to be the man driving. If he's always sleeping after one, one hour, collect, collect the steering from him. <laughs> collect the steering. I say, honey, sit down on the other side. Sit down. Don't drive us into the bush. <laughs> There's no rule. I don't know why people think it has to be a man because you are traveling to London now. You say, I'm the man. I'm the man, I'm the man. Ah, uh, and 10 minutes, you're doing like this. I say, honey, bless you, honey, bless you, bless you. Next service station, just do a pullover. <laughs> just pull over if you don't mind. <laughs> you say, what, what is it, what is it? No, 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 nothing, nothing, just pull over. Then don't just snatch the key from his hand, you'll cause problem. A man's ego is very strong. It's very strong. Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> you just say, give me the key. I want to go. Ah, you want to go strong. <laughs> you say, honey, you know what? I feel like driving today. <laughs> can I do some? Can I do the next hour? You say, yeah, sure, sure. Why not? You say, I like the way you drive, but just let me have the key. <laughs> Don't give it back to him. <laughs> drive your thing cool and come back. There's no rule that says so. There's no rule. There is a, there, there, somebody is better with planning. You want to go on a holiday? Somebody is better with planning. He can plan and connect all the hotels and everything, and you will still get it at a good price. You, you just go to Sky Go, choose this one, this one. Everything will be disjointed. The, the day you move for taxi is not the day that they're expecting the flight to land. <laughs> everything all over the place. <laughs> Give it to the person that has strength. Give it to the person. That is part of what that grace does. Grace, number three, for parental success. Similar to marriage, dance to your strength when it comes to raising your children. The Bible says in Isaiah 8, 18, I and the children whom the Lord has given me, we are for signs and for wonders in Israel. Everything that you need to input into your children, dance to your strengths. Now we say the man is the king, he's the priest, he's the, you know, all those things we say, he's the prophet, he's the this. All that thing is not in the Bible. It's not. Yes, the man is the head of the wife under Christ. But a wise woman understands also that she's also under Christ. So if there is the wisdom to do certain things, if she is more gifted with Bible teaching for children, don't say the man has to do it. Don't. Let her do it. Don't say because I'm the man, I have to be teaching. No. Do you know when Joyce Meyer, she's about, she's turning 79, I think she just turned 79, yeah, great woman of God. When she started ministry, the pastor called her about 50 years ago. The pastor called her and said, you shouldn't be doing this. Your husband should be the one doing it. He said, how can you be teaching your husband? He sat down. So the woman wanted to be obedient. So they sat down. David tried, preached to David Meyer, preached two messages by himself. He said, you know what? If they are not going to allow you to be teaching, we'll move to another place because this is not my calling. And from that day, 
David will be sat down, the wife is teaching. And they went all over the world doing that. At least all over America doing that. That is the way God ordained it. And the woman is still totally submitted to her husband. It did not bring, it did not bring disrespect. Because it does not bring disrespect. If you are functioning in the wisdom of God, in the role you should play, you will not be disrespectful to one another. No. If the woman is the higher income earner, so be it. It doesn't give room for disrespect. Who wants to know about your finances? Who wants to know? Who cares to know? Let us just look at these things and input into our children. When we were young, my mother was the one that used to do small, small side side business. She would sell shirts in her workplace. She would do a poultry. She would do those little, little things. Like I said, my father never earned any extra. So any time that is like 10th of the month, don't, my father has no money to give you again because <laughs> his salary has finished. But my mom will always have something little for somebody. And they play to that strength all their lives. And it never caused any disrespect. Let us learn to work together. Children, obey your parents. Receive grace to obey your parents. Ephesians 6.1, in the Lord. Obey your parents. Ask for grace. Children of nowadays, there is a spirit that brings high-headedness. And you compare your parents to other parents. Don't do that. If you are under the sound of my voice and you hear this message, please don't do that. There are contexts for everybody. There are some parents that have three generations in this country that don't owe any house mortgage or anything. They don't need to because there are generations that have paid that in advance. They are not in the same class with your, <laughs> your parents. Your parents in many cases came here when they were in their 20s, 30s. Some came in their 40s. Some came in their 50s to start all over again. Walk with your parents. Pray for your parents. Support your parents. Understand that they are working to give you the opportunity they never had. Obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, Ephesians 6, 2, which is the first commandment with a promise. Verse 3, say that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. This is very powerful. And you fathers, do not provoke your children, verse 4, to wrath. Keep drawing grace not to provoke your children to wrath. May God continue to help us in Jesus' name. Amen. You need to know how to dialogue with your children at the different stages of your life. If you keep talking to your children... As you talk to them five years ago, ten years ago, you will get a revolt. You need to understand that they are going through different phases of life. And you need to understand the male. You need to understand the female. You need the grace of God to open your mind to see how to keep bringing those things together to make for parental success. Parenting is hard work. You must pray and trust God for the wisdom. No two children are the same. Never say to your children, why don't you look at your brother? He does things differently. You make them enemies from that day. Don't do it. Everybody is gifted differently among your children. And not all your children will do things. In fact, they, none of them may do things exactly like you. Because they are individually different. I love my father a lot. But we do things, many, many things differently. I think apart from serving Christ together, I think many <laughs> other things we do differently. I mean, a very different profession that he was. I respect him, but I find that... He helped me to find my identity. And I'm by the grace of God doing that for my children now. Find your identity. Locate who God wants you to be. Don't force your children to be anything other than what God wants them to be. And may God give us the grace to do it well. In the name of Jesus. The last thing I've kind of touched on here, but I'll close on that, is the grace for wealth creation. The grace for wealth creation. God warned his children. He said when they get to the land that is promising them, they should not forget. This is Deuteronomy 8, 18. Go to verse 18. He said, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you what? Power. Deuteronomy 8, 18. Now verse 18. He gives you power to get wealth. Verse 18. He gives you power to get wealth. He has called us to walk. He has called us to serve. Let us remember that he is the one that gives us power to get wealth. Every one of us must understand this. Whatever level of life you are, the wealth that God gives you, both in terms of your health and riches and resources, is come from him. David said that all things have come from God. All things have come from God. 
everything that we have. So never ever let your mind tell you that whatever you have is yours. Keep drawing grace for more. And God will continue to give you the power to make wealth. In the mighty name of Jesus. This is an essential part of what I talked about in kingdom service. You need the ability of God. Wealth that God gives, gives you stability. Protects you from being vulnerable to the things that the enemy makes difficult. So God will be opening you up to the sources of wealth or to the channels of wealth that he is creating for you in Jesus' name. When God blesses you, always remember him. When God opens your mind to be able to do things, never forget his kingdom. As I practice as a consultant, I've told you many times, those of you who know very well, the truth is there are many, many things I've done, many things I've done that as the money comes to my hand like this, I put it into this work, I put it into some gospel work. I do it because I realize, not that I don't have personal needs, but I realize that the power to get wealth has come from God, and if there is any need in his kingdom, then I should be meeting that need. I don't go, I don't ever in one year go on a holiday that will cost me a few thousands not having put the same or much more into the things of God. Because I think it is just a robbery for me to go and sit down near one beach and, and, and be looking up to this guy, to the same God who gave me the money. And I'm not caring about his house. I'm not caring about his work. I don't do that. And if you want God to be committed to your resources, this is how you must have the mind. He said you shall remember the Lord your God. You want this grace to be flowing in your direction, to be making wealth. Let God be remembered all the way. I say, let God be remembered all the way. Let God be remembered all the time. And he will continue to sustain you in the mighty name of Jesus. I want to trust God with you today that this grace that God wants to release to you to make you the shining light that he has proposed will be manifest in your life. I say to be manifest in your life. It will be evident in your life in the mighty name of Jesus. God will deliver you from every struggle. I say God will deliver you from every struggle. Whatever that struggle is, God will deliver you from it as you embrace his grace. In the name of Jesus. I close with 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9 as we stand to pray for our communion. The Bible says, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Let's stand to our feet. Well, well, well.